Hello? Uh, hello, De hello, Dimitri. Listen, I, I can't hear too well. Do you suppose you could turn the music down just a little? Oh, that's much better. <laughs> yes. Fine, I can hear you now, Dimitri. Clear and plain and coming through fine. I'm coming through fine too, eh? Good, then... Well then, as you say, we're, we're both coming through fine. Good. Well, it's good that you're fine and, and I'm fine. I agree with you, it's great to be fine. <laughs> now then, Dimitri, you know how we've always talked about the possibility of something going wrong with the bomb. The bomb, Dimitri. The hydrogen bomb. Welcome to Back to the Frame Rate, part of the Western Media Podcast Network, a weekly podcast discussing movie news, reviews, and recommendations. We just heard a clip from Dr. Strangelove, a tie-in to this week's episode where we'll be reviewing Tetris and recommending some other Cold War thrillers. I'm Nathan Schur, and with me as always are Sam Cole and Ellie Escobar. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, oh my god. Don't worry, Welcome like, to the hey. show, Ellie. <laughs> I'm here. That's your cue to speak. Okay. Wake up, my co hosts. All right. <laughs> well, here we are again. Hey, you know what? Mm -hmm. We are on episode 10. That is some major milestone. We have That's made crazy. just as many episodes as there are Fast and Furious movies. Oh my god. That's true. Do you remember how we started? Like, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're just a little bit better than that. Oh, no, we're getting really good at this. Back in January or February. We're no, not even, we're not even drinking. Like very... <laughs> I'm drinking. See, I got my, got my f flask of water. We started in February. Now it's April. And after that, it'll be May. That's right. We well, we got a. I think we got a fun show tonight. We're going to be reviewing the new Apple T. Is it Apple TV or Apple Plus? Apple TV Plus <laughs> original Tetris uh, in a little bit. But before we get to that, we're going to just catch up with everyone to see what we've been doing the past week. We didn't do that last week. We kind of jumped right into what we've been watching. But I want to hear. Um, you know, last week. We've totally skipped over a very important thing with you, Ellie. Uh, you took a week off, and uh, there was a, a, an important reason for that. So I took a week off to do an intensive acting course with the one and only Larry Moss. And uh, I was studying about 12 hours every day preparing for my presentation for my performance in his class and I got to play to do a play called uh, Orpheus Descending by Tennessee Williams dudes what a challenge it was it was a challenge uh, I learned a lot and I kind of miss being there was this my uh, phrasing this was it was this like a this wasn't like a solo like performance, right? You you were performing with other actors. Or can you tell us a little bit about what yes. what it entailed, the whole process? Well, no, it was it wasn't just me, but I did have a co-star. You mm -hmm. know, like there was <clears throat> another student with me, and basically the the process started a month prior to the week I took off, uh, just preparing for the play and learning the the words, and and it's basically just dissecting the play completely understanding but the hardest challenge for me was that a lot of the there's a lot of phrases that didn't make sense to me because you know english is my second language so a lot of the phrases i had to go to the internet and look up you know go to the dictionary i'm like what does that mean you know what is this and what is that 
And one of the things uh, with Larry is he's big in pronunciation, right? He's mm -hmm. enunciate, enunciate. And um, it's one of the things that I've learned the most. And one of my biggest fears is that he was going to say, enunciate with your accent. You need to enunciate. And he never mentioned one word. You know why? Because I kept practicing enunciation for weeks before the play. <laughs> it was like Peter Piper. But, you know, what is one of those like tongue twisters too? The, the tongue twisters, uh, yeah. You know. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, and so. So uh, where where was, does this put you at the at, after this is all said and done? What have you learned from this? Like, where what is gonna? What's the next so, step after this? This this whole intense week basically uh, taught me what it takes to play with you know the bigger leaguers like. DiCaprio and, and Viola Davis, what they have to do to prepare. I had about 50 pages of work. Wow. 50 pages of work that I had written about my character and the story. It's ridiculous. But you don't even think about it because you're in the moment learning and writing about your character and everything. And I actually put a stage in my house. Um, I took the scene from the book and transformed my house into that. Um, I'm in a store, you know, back in the 1950s. Oh, cool. So I, I bought all these props and things like that from Amazon to turn my background into um, a, a store, a mercantile store for dry goods and things like that. I even got a phone from the 1950s um, because <laughs> Nice. My scene, wow. my scene begins with me on the phone. I mean, it was so emotional. I, it was so emotional. The whole experience was, was almost spiritual, <laughs> you know. Um, so for me, after this, it's just really putting into work um, everything that I've learned, using it to prepare for any auditions that I've caught. I have lined up or uh, if I get cast in a role to use that and put it into um, preparing for any role that I cast to or auditions. So that's, that's, well, that's my wonderful. Goal. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. We're both very, very happy for, for, thank you for you. And uh, that's very exciting. I, I've never yeah. taken, I took an acting class in, in college and I wish I had done more with that because I think I, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a trained actor and I have done some acting on stage and in some film that I think it would have, I would have benefited from some more formal training because um, I do yeah, have I an think interest in it. <laughs> a stage, a stage acting is so different from film acting. It's, I feel it's more challenging. Uh, in fact, I, I do think it's more challenging but I have to tell you, I'm always learning. So <laughs> to tell you, this week, oh my god, like it never stops. I I I do another class, and in this class, I've been given a challenge. I have to. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to. <laughs> I've been given a challenge to. So I paired. I was paired up with two other students, and we had to write a script. And film a short film, a two a two minute short film. Oh, that sounds fun. That sounds cool, actually. I never, I never done anything like this. So we got together with my my people. It turns out that none of them know how to write anything. So we're like, I don't know how to write. I don't know how to write. Do you know how to write? No, I don't know how to write. <laughs> how am I gonna write? So we're just stuck in like what? So I ended up writing the script. It's called. The Night Creeper. Ooh. Ooh, I like the title. <laughs> Is it star Jake Gyllenhaal? Just kidding. <laughs> oh my god, Nightcrawler? Yeah, Nightcrawler, right? Yeah. So it's her, the... her. Sorry. <laughs> it's called the... So guess what? You know how I like serial killer films? Oh, well, we know. 
<laughs> well, it's not a kind of about a kidnapper that's a serial killer. Interesting. Mm-hmm. That's kind of cool. So mm-hmm. it can be creepy and uh, were you guys shooting it like just in an alley at night by your home or something or? No, so here's the challenge. We're all in different areas of the world. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. So, get, some, uh, so, get some green screen going in this. <laughs> dude, I don't even know how we're going to do this. Like, how do, we, how do we do the background so it matches? Um, well, you know, if you want to insert two actors from different places, you can use Adobe Fusion or After Effects <laughs> and insert them into the same visual effect shot. I'd be, I'd be happy to talk about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so that's Very my cool. challenge for this week, um, and I am. It's due on the tenth of April, and just to finish up, let me tell you how my week went. I went to get my inspection sticker on Saturday. When they returned mm-hmm. the card to me, they returned it with a sticker that says one. And I'm thinking, like one, it's three, it's March, it's April, it should be four, right? No. Mm-hmm. The guy says, well, I can't give you a four a month of April sticker because you never got your sticker last year. They do oh, that no. now. They do that now. If you like, if what? you try to like sneak into the next month, like you, if your inspection sticker like expired in, I think in the last month or two, they'll give you one for april but they won't do it if it's long if it's expired a long time ago the the inspection sticker that's for the back right of the license plate right where it's just like the year like the month and the year this is that's the inspection sticker we're talking about right no No, that's that's like that's the registration yeah oh man i should check on that yeah (laughs) sorry (laughs) dude damn it i thought the police stopped you if it's it's expired Oh man! I was like, "Wait, yeah. I never came last year." <laughs> yeah, so that's my week, uh, my weekend. I gotta and, check uh, on that. <laughs> As Sam leaves the podcast <laughs> and <laughs> runs out to the yeah, right, time. exactly, yeah. <laughs> no, no, all right, <laughs> okay. Well, um, well, thanks for sharing your your week with us, Sally. That's uh, of course. That's Thank you for asking. Right. <laughs> hmm. Sam, any, anything you want to share about your week or? Uh, I mean, I've got it. I saw there's a movie that I saw this week that I liked, but in terms of what I did, just sort of like tax preparation and uh, like some some organizational stuff. Yeah, I really got nothing. Like you know, shot. I mean, I, I shot a, a new episode of of Walks of World, my YouTube show, and the episode will come out well, but the filming of it was not particularly thrilling. Uh, but it went it went smoothly. So excellent. All right. My, my, my week, uh, I just get a quick smorgasbord of things that I did. I purchased half a quart of wood, which is always an exciting thing. Um, what? For, wow. for only, for only $60. So I thought I you feel... were going to say something else. I was like, Ooh, can I have some? Just... What does that do? <laughs> it means I just bought a whole bunch of wood for, right. for almost no money at all. So th- I feel like that's, that's a small victory. That because is a victory. You have a... Yeah, it is. Is that for chimney? Um, yeah, so we can burn it in our fireplace or for campfires. So I'm, oh, I'm just yeah. really excited. I feel I feel good about that. I got I got enough wood to last me for a year or more. Who knows? We know um, we're going. The other thing I kind of did, which is kind of film related, is I think I mentioned this on the show before. I got I got two kids, and they are two little mini actresses. Oh. Um, I made a movie with one of them almost a year ago. But my and she's um, eleven. Back then, she was ten when I made this movie. It was called "The End Is Nigh," and that's streaming on YouTube. I'll drop I'll drop that link in there again. But the other one is jealous that I made a movie with her older sister, and she's oh. only she's only five. It's just like, <laughs> Daddy, how come you made a movie with your my sister but not with me? And I'm like, Well, um, because I I don't know why, but it's just because <laughs> I ha- I did. And she's like, she wanted to make a movie as well. And she's five years old. So like, okay, we'll make one. So we, in the past month, we have been working on a script together. And we shot the first half of the movie in the past week. It's called The Lost Puppy. It's about our dog, Stella. 
<laughs> that accidentally gets out of the house and gets lost. And my daughter is out looking for her all around the neighborhood. And we shot all the interiors this past week. So <laughs> she's having a wonderful time. Well, actually, I can't say she's having a wonderful time. Filmmaking and, and, and actressing is, is hard work. She's discovering. After about eight minutes, she needs to take a break and eat candy. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not always cracked up to be, but she is having a wonderful time doing this. So I just wanted to share that. So look for The Lost Puppy coming to your local theater. <laughs> not. But coming to probably Yay. no 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 theater, and it's probably never going to hit even YouTube because I don't think this is uh, something I even want to share. I, I did enjoy the ending. <laughs> I that was really good. Yeah, well, that, that was that yeah. was a legitimate production. We put yeah. some money. We put some money into that. This is honestly my five year old with no production value and me and a camera and I don't even know if we have microphones necessarily going on, but it's, it's, she's having a wonderful time. She thinks she's a movie star. We actually did write this and I'm, I'm in this. She's in this. My daughter. Oh, here's the other thing. My older daughter who is the actress in the, in, and is nigh is the director. Oh, her. cool. And I'm the camera operator. So we're nice. all, it's a family adventure. Yeah. Is she, so, a, is she a kind director or is she like a creative tyrant? Basically? Um, <laughs> or Honestly, can you, can you I, not I, diplomatically answer that question? I really, I really can't. But, <laughs> but you know what's kind of fun because I'm actually teaching her how to direct. Oh, this. that's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. So it, it is. It is kind of cool. She she's got some work cut out for her to learn how to direct. But anyways, it's it's been a it's been a fun experience. So that's what I've been doing this past week and uh, some fun family filmmaking. So yeah, let's let's get to uh, what we've been watching this week. Who would uh, like to? Uh, uh, by the way, that? Nathan, my my first name is Starlight. By just letting you know. Okay, okay, I'll keep you in mind for <laughs> if you want. Stella. To... <laughs> I'll um I'll jump in by saying okay. that I I saw um I did see a film this week. The honestly, the one movie I saw this week, but I did go to the theater and I saw Dungeons and Dragons: Honor Among Thieves. Oh, cool! Um, of it was yeah. enjoyable. I uh, like. I first off, I have to say that I never played the game. Like I missed that game. That that was not a part of my childhood. So knowing nothing about it as a just like blank audience member coming in, it was a fun impressive like it's 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 very light it's not you know like heavy or epic um like lord of the rings or or something like that but i found it um the cast is charming there's a lot of humor there were some like laugh out loud moments it was a decent fantasy um adventure film like not amazing but but good i enjoyed it and i enjoyed the characters enough that if there was a sequel i would i would definitely see it i found it engaging and I'll say one more thing about it. This gives nothing away. It's just kind of the tone of the movie. There's a scene where they're in a cave, this giant underground layer, and like you see this dragon's eyes come out of the darkness, and it's like a total Peter Jackson moment, and you think it's going to be serious and terrifying. And the dragon comes out of the cave, and it turns out that it's this like giant, rotund, obese dragon that can barely move and can't fly because it's like so fat. So it just rolls down the slope towards them like a bowling ball. And it was a really funny visual gag. And the movie is funny, full of crazy stuff like that. So I would solidly recommend, I would give it a B slash B plus, but it was entertaining. And Hugh Grant as the villain was especially amusing to me, but that <laughs> is basically the film I saw this week. I don't think I watched anything else to be quite honest. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Aside from Tetris, which was amazing, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> right, and it did pretty good at the box office. I think I, I see it did thirty-seven million. I don't know if that was above or below its expectations, but it um, was slightly above expectations. It did slightly better than they thought. Um, so it did like not too bad. It was it was breezy. I enjoyed it. It took a big chunk out of John Wick Chapter Four, though. That took a, a, a kind of a nosedive. I was kind of surprised. Yeah, it did. Um, yeah. I mean, it, and it, but it's it's, it's still because John Wick still made like twenty nine million, so it was a dive. Yeah. But it's like Dungeons and Dragons kind of bit into the same audience. I think a little. Yeah, bit. they kind of cannibalize yeah. each other for sure. But 
Very cool. Um, I am hearing some good things about it, though. So it's kind of on my radar of things. If I can check out, I, I will. Honestly, I would not have. I I had no interest until I heard the buzz. And then Rotten Tomatoes is like 90%. Like, it's because of the positive buzz. That's the reason why I went. And I'm glad I did. But I was not. Like, I have not been anticipating or looking forward to this movie. I went to it on a whim. And it turned out to be pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Always a fan of Chris Pine too. He's, you know, I wish they made the friggin' more Star Trek movies, but that's that's a whole other can yeah. of worms. So, yeah. <laughs> great, great. Um, Ellie, anything you want to share? I watched two films, uh, Missing and Ten by Ten. Okay, Miss, is it and Missing? Missing. The, is this is that Mi- the. 20 2003 missing i tell me which missing this is no that's the 2023 that just came out um it's oh, plain oh, i believe okay. an apple tv and uh prime it's by the director I, by will merrick and nick johnson okay. they i got all excited for a moment because i thought you were talking about the i think the, Tom, I think the tommy lee jones right Wasn't that yeah right? 2003 yeah. the ron howard movie yeah. and i like that movie the missing <laughs> the, future the missing. review, future no, review of the no. missing, maybe one day okay no Sorry, i go think ahead. this Keep guy still i think this guy did search something like that another movie oh missing search. i know what you're talking about yeah i i talked about yeah. this film early on it's kind of a spiritual sequel to searching yes it is yes uh, well I, I completely uh, yeah. I completely put um, this movie out of my mind <laughs> yes already <laughs> I liked it um, that's how, that's how much of was... an impression it left on me okay <laughs> yes go ahead okay the, my my takeaway from this film if anything it's how anyone can find you anywhere in the world <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, just That's based true. on on Google and your history in Google, and uh, oh my goodness, it it's just basically a, a movie set on the screen, on the computer and telephone and iPhones and, and things like that, and cameras it's over the sc- world. Screen life, screen life is a is a screen big uh, genre, um, and this kind of goes back to. I think films starting with like unfriended and yeah, I think the unfriended movies were kind of like set the tone for these types of movies back like 10 years ago. Um, I did like, did you see searching? I haven't seen it. I did. Searching is, searching is fantastic. And that's John Cho in it. It is. These are also somehow connected in a very loose fashion. And I, they have not, link them together yet and i'm wondering if they're going to at some point and they're going to make a third one they've already announced that is in this world somehow i don't know what they're going to call it like finding or i don't know how how they're going to do it but they are brilliantly constructed how they do this and i'm in awe Mm. of how they can make these movies in this fashion all taught all told on a screen using tablets and smart watches and phones it is very cool how they do these movies the i question the the quality necessarily of the stories that are told in these this one i thought was kind of inferior to searching but still i i i praise them for what they still are able to do so i'm not i'm not yeah the the technical the technical part yeah, the technical part yeah. for me was pretty awesome to see all of that and how they put mm-hmm. that together uh, and how uh, how this girl ends up calling the cops by uh, just saying, Siri, call 911. And her phone is on her desk in her house and she's in yeah. another place. Uh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It was really nice. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and then I watched 10 by 10. And I don't know why I keep coming back to missing, kidnapping, serial killers movies, but I just do. We, I we, like we that kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and 10 by 10 is a 2018 film. And uh, Kelly Riley is in there. I've seen her before in other things. But basically, it's about a woman who 
used to be a nurse and killed this man's wife. And uh, he basically kidnaps her and puts her in a 10 by 10 room <laughs> because he wants her to um, confess that she killed his wife. And there's a fight, and yeah, it was it was entertaining. Nothing big about that film, though. Very good. <laughs> All right, I'll share a little bit about what I've been watching. Um, I'll keep it <laughs> brief here. I saw, uh, I was playing some catch up with this year's Oscar nominated <laughs> films. I finally watched Empire of Light this past week. This is another. 2022 drama about the power of cinema and how it just can save us all. Uh, seems like we had a bunch of these in the last year. This was written and directed by Sam Mendes and stars Olivia Coleman as the manager of a theater in the South coast of England in the early eighties. This story uh, is really about her awakening as she strikes up an unlikely friendship with a new young employee uh, who was played by Michael Ward. What I did love about this film is the actual theater itself. It's actually, they actually used a, a location, this absolutely gorgeous historical relic of a venue called the Dreamland Cinema. It was originally built in 1923 and it's been closed for the past 15 years, unfortunately. Uh, the staging of the film is, is mostly in this location and, and just makes up a majority of the film. And it's just gorgeous, the, this venue. Um, what, however, the film itself, I found to be a, a mixed bag. Olivia Coleman is, is giving her all in this film, but it falters. I think with an unfocused story, it's just ping ponging between this complicated relationship between Coleman's character and the character of, of Ward, the, the, the new employee, her mental health issues, which are treated very oddly in this film, and is set against the backdrop of the, these skinheads that are running rampant and spreading racism and anarchy in the, in the city. Roger Deakins was nominated for cinematography in this film. And yeah, it's good, but it's nowhere near his best work. I, I, told, I, mean, I just want to say I totally agree with you. I saw the film. I saw Empire of Light recently, so I'm kind of on the same page as you here, yeah. So Emperor Light, it was okay. It was just okay. And it's uh, streaming on HBO Max is where I saw it. And it's also on VOD. The other thing that I saw, and I think I mentioned this about a month or so ago, I have been slowly making my way through the Billy Wilder filmography. It's kind of my own personal retrospective. And I just recently caught up with 1957's The Spirit of St. Louis. This is the film that depicts the epic crossing of the Atlantic by a single engine plane by um, from by Charles Lindbergh. I'm basically at the halfway point watching all of Wilder's films. And this is one, this one is by far, uh, probably encompasses the fewest Billy Wilder flourishes of all of his films. It doesn't, it's a very point A to point B story, uh, story structure without much of the quirkiness, humor, and kind of, film noir flourishes that a lot of Billy Wilder films have. In fact, I, if I didn't know this was a Billy Wilder film, I never, I never would have guessed it is one. All that aside, the spirit of St. Louis stars, uh, Jimmy Stewart as Charles Lim Lindbergh. And he's very charming in this film. Of course he always is. It's, but it's not until the second half of this film when Lindbergh takes flight that this film actually has any kind of tension in it. But overall, it's not one of my favorite Billy Wilder joints, but it's not terrible either. Jimmy Stewart is, you know, he's always fun to watch. So it's, uh, it was okay. So that is available on VOD. And those are the two movies that I watched this week. So, yeah. And I'm <laughs> looking forward to the, the back half of Billy Wilder's catalog. And I'll keep you up to date with some of my, those highlights. So... All right. Are we ready to get to our review of Tetris? Yes, Tetris. indeed. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I played for five minutes. I still see falling blocks in my dreams. It's poetry, art and math, all working in magical synchronicity. It's... It's the perfect game. 
Tetris? Tetris. 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 I don't get it. It's a combination of tetra, Greek for four, and tennis. Tennis. The Russian inventor, he likes tennis. Hazel. Yeah. This game isn't just addictive, it stays with you. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Hank, only 10 other people in the world have seen what you're about to see. It's called the Game Boy. Package it with Tetris. All right, so we are here discussing Tetris, the new movie streaming on Apple TV+. Plus. How about Sam? I'm going to just throw it at you. What did you think of Tetris? I liked the movie a lot, and I was surprised how much I liked it because I really wasn't sure what to expect. I knew nothing about like how the video game started. I had no idea about all the political drama um and all that went on with it and i must say i very like cynically when it when it opened there was this kind there's this kind of like animated style that um instead of shooting exteriors of buildings the movie opens and it says las vegas and it's like cartoon imagery of vegas like video game imagery zooming in on the character and my cynical first reaction to that was i thought it was like a cheap sort of budget saving technique but then I saw that it was kind of woven into the style of the film. Um, but I liked it. I mean, I, I I thought like maybe the cinematics in some parts and it was up and down, but because I was so intrigued by the story and, and all the dramatic like business negotiations and the double crossing and the Russian government and all that, having no idea about that part of history regarding that game. To me, the movie was entertaining solely because it was informing me of all that in a very like fast paced, generally pretty good movie. So, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it. I would strongly recommend it. Um, as also a huge fan of Nintendo, it's like the Nintendo is referenced many times in the film. They go to their headquarters. Um, I just liked, I love behind the scenes stuff like that. I mean, I was a big fan of has nothing to do with this film, but the social network, about mm. the creation of Facebook. And I like seeing the turmoil and the business negotiations behind things that we just accept as part of the culture. We all know Tetris. We all love it. Who knew, at least I didn't know, of the, the fight for its existence was so brutal that I sort of incorrectly assumed that, that things just come out of the ether, you know, the ether. Like when I was a child, all my favorite movies like Indiana Jones, you just assumed they were just sort of like immaculately conceived somewhere and everything went perfectly. And that's why I love hearing nitty gritty difficulty behind the scenes stuff. So this movie felt kind of right up my alley, to be quite honest. Excellent. All right. Ellie, what are your thoughts? Well, this is not my thing. <laughs> As you might know, my thing is, mm -hmm. okay, you already know what my thing is. There was I no serial the killers, we know. <laughs> <laughs> there was, you know, there was no, there wasn't really too much violence in the film, I feel. It wasn't, um, which is kind of nice, you know. Um, I don't know much about video games. I'm not a video a gamer. I Most I played was Pac-Man and the pinball machines. Well, that movie's coming soon. You know that. I totally hear that. See, and I'm I'm a, I'm also I'm a lot more of a gamer, so like it has that regardless of the quality of the movie, it had that in with me because of being a gamer, you know what I mean? So it's like I totally yeah. understand. I can see why there'd be a distance. I get that. Yeah. So I'm watching it with my kid and, and I'm like we both watched it and he's a gamer. He's like full time gamer. Like he makes money from that. Right. Um, and, and I was like, so, so <laughs> I kept asking, so, so wait, what is Tetris again? The, but why did they do that? Yeah, but, well, what about that? <laughs> it's like, mom, just watch the movie. <laughs> and so, but, but I'm not sure I can follow this, but honestly, there's parts in the movie that I really liked. Um, uh, you know, there's, I, t I actually felt it reminded me a little bit of, uh, Fargo. 
Really? Wow. wow that is okay. not, I, I am interested in hearing this connection. Yeah. I like I, wait, both movies had snow in it at one point. <laughs> okay. there, was, there was a snowy day in Russia, I, I, right? I, I also want to hear this connection because that was that's a leap, but go. No, wait, I'm, I'm wait, all ears, Snowy. Wait, it, it's. Uh, do you, uh, do you maybe mean I'm, Fargo? I'm, I'm in the wrong movie. <laughs> No, no. Maybe it's not Fargo. Maybe. Oh my God. Well, Fargo no. has. If you like serial killing, Fargo's got the murders that you want in it. Like that's your kind of movie. A lot of people get. One guy gets. People gets like killed in a wood chipper in that film. That's an. That's an LA movie right there. It's not Fargo. No. Not. No. Not Fargo. Yeah. Okay. I forgot the name. It's the uh, Sam. We must say it. Two mules for Sister Sarah, right? Two, two meals? Oh, 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 oh. You're talking about um, Argo. Argo. Ar- right. Argo. Argo, yes. Yes. Thank I you. totally can see Ar- that. That's... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So Fargo rise with Argo. No. I, good, good, good double I, feature. I know though. you can't, we can't see video here, but when you said Fargo by accident, the look on Nathan's face, he was like, what the hell? <laughs> like, what is that all about? <laughs> No, but 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 Argo, that actually, to, I I one hundred percent see the connection to Argo. Both political situations. I know. Also, I can I can tell you another reason why it would remind you of Argo, but that goes into spoiler territories because the because all I'll uh, say for now is that the two movies have similar climaxes. Yeah. In ter- you know, so you in terms me, of right? airport stuff. You, yeah. yeah. I yeah. I I totally yeah. get you yeah. there, like a thousand percent. Yeah. And- but structurally, there's I'm, there's I'm structural this, similarities, yeah. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, but I thought I enjoyed it, you know. And if you're a gamer and you like this kind of stuff, you're you're gonna love it. You're gonna enjoy it. Okay. Yeah, that's um, my two cents. Okay. <laughs> well, I have some thoughts on this. So, full disclosure, I I watched this film. Okay, I think Saturday. So a few nights ago. And it was giving me a headache for the following reasons. <laughs> Interesting. Huh. Elord, Mirasoft, Andromeda, Bulletproof, PC rights, video game rights, <laughs> arcade rights, handheld rights. The terminology in this film that the filmmakers expect us to simply grasp, oftentimes spoken in foreign languages, I thought was kind of a big ask. And I'm thinking to myself, why do I care about any of this? We've got our protagonist, Hank Rogers, our, our hero, a man who allegedly risked everything, his career, his marriage, his life, to secure the rights to a video game. And even though he's not American, he's the representation of the Western american capitalist cowboy. But I think... Uh, it has to be noted that right at the beginning of the movie, it states, as many movies do, based on a true story. So like I said, you know, I watched this movie a few nights ago, and I, I actually watched this with my wife, who I think got a lot more out of this, and she actually kind of has uh, a bit more of a, of a legal background than I did. She, she took, um, well, she didn't go to law school, but she took classes and understood everything immediately that was happening in this movie. And I was scratching my head through a lot of what was going on here. And I don't know, maybe I was too tired watching this, <laughs> but cause there was just so much I felt was being thrown at me. I, I, so I was, I was struggling. I I was struggling. So guess what I did? I watched this movie a second time because <laughs> I had to, I was, right. I was that confused and I got so much more out of this the second time. Sam, you had no problem with this. I don't no, know. No, I had, I had, see, it's, it's interesting because, yeah, I, I did, I did have no problem with it. I, for me, I thought it presented the, the kind of, the information like fairly clearly, but it was also, I kind of liked all the sort of back and forth, sort of like vicious attempts at ownership and distribution and all that stuff. And for me, what I liked about it was, the movie was presenting that like authentic business world in the way that sort of like mm-hmm. the social network portrays like the tech world or like but wall so, street portrays yeah. wall street. And yeah. so for me, I for me, I, I just was like, I just was on board. Like I just, I absorbed it right away. And I was like, Oh yeah. man, especially around like when thing without getting into it, when things were going well for Hank Rogers, 
and all of a sudden they didn't go well, I was like really invested. I was like, oh my God, how's he going to get out of this deal? Like the movie <laughs> hooked me in a way that I was not expecting it. Like I was not expecting it to work the way it did at me, but I, I totally yeah. hear your point because it's storytelling style. It just throws the company names and it also doesn't help that all the exterior buildings shots are the same visual effect you know they're all, like they're yeah. all bunker style brick yeah uh, i mean yeah, yeah. concrete building. well anyways so um, we we talk yeah, about i don't, this like it. I don't know if i like to live in russia by the way oh no this does not it's paint crazy. russia in the 80s as a place oh, yeah. you want to be well we talk about a decent amount in this podcast you know when it's not working or or when it's consistent but you know i feel the tone in this film was very odd uh, the film is essentially a drama about contracts and, and rights acquisitions, but it also wants to be a, a spy thriller, complete with car chases and KGB agents threatening our hero mm. and his family. The movie works so hard to make the audience aware that danger lurks around every corner for Hank, and it was it was a little bit much for me, and I I really question how much of all this is authentic. And it, yes, the the filmmakers are working really hard to create that tension. But I, I've done some more reading and research on this, and it's really clear that, and the filmmakers have already admitted this, so much of this movie is embellished to oh, I'm the, sure. to the yeah. nth degree. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they, I, in the end, after the second viewing, I will admit, I was entertained and I had a much better time watching this, knowing who the players were in this. But so much of this is fabricated, and that's why it's it's. I kind of have mixed feelings about all of this. That said, there are many moments that I can't deny were, were a lot of fun in this film. I thought Taron Egerton was very charming and charismatic as Hank Rogers, albeit, um, as Alexei's wife put it, dumb but honest. I thought was a really fun moment, which I think encapsulates everything that he does in this. He's 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 really good in this. Um, his cavalier can-do attitude brought a lot of life and energy into what could have been a very, very tedious plot. Um, and what a great mustache he is sporting in this in this movie. I just I like that a lot. I have to say that um, he did a, he did a great job. I thought, yeah, he did, and um, an awesome eighty soundtrack in this movie. So I that big thumbs up for that as well. So that's you know that's all I'm going to say about uh, my spoiler free comments on this. We can uh, if anyone else has anything else to say, otherwise we can get to spoilers. Um what what you were saying um Ellie Ellie about how it reminds you about um Argo just in terms of like style, there was that whole like they they're escaping Russia at the end. They're going to the airport. They're being pursued yeah. right up till the moment they got on the plane. It was very exactly. Close to that. It's very close to that. For there was... me, it's it's so close to that. And like Nathan, I know I I totally hear what you're saying about them trying to like embellish it and make it a bit more of a spy thriller. That that definitely did feel a bit tacked on to me in some scenes more than others. I liked the straight up like shouting in boardrooms and like around tables and trying to get people to sign contracts. Yeah. That to me is real. But the car chases were like, they were trying to make the movie like sexier quote unquote, you know what I mean? Yeah. And they, they had it. The only thing is in the car chase towards the end, the cars kind of get pixelated, like, you know, like a video game and they're doing this effect. And stylistically, I was thinking, why is this necessary? And the only thing I could come up with, again, a cynical viewpoint was that the cars would get special effecty at the, when they would go do like hairpin turns. So I figure, I feel, I feel like the visual effects on that car chase was almost like a cop out and maybe made it easier than filming some actual you vehicular, <laughs> even though they did, they didn't really film a car chase, but it just stylistically seemed weird to me. And there was one shot of all the tanks um, like in, in Russia, all the tanks parading down the street. It was a good shot, like conceptually frame wise, but it was like pretty obviously CGI. It didn't bother me that much, but I was like, ooh, this looks a little like this could be rendered more or something. Just my opinion. Yeah. I mean, it was clear that they did this on a, on a relatively low budget. And yeah. I mean, listen, it's, it's a, it's a Apple plus 
original movie. They were not going to spend fifty million dollars on this, and and it shows. And it's about the story, so I, I I don't have any problems with any of those things. I mean, I the, the whole pixelated car chase I thought was kind of cheesy. I didn't think it was necessary. It didn't, I, I you know, I I cracked a smile for a moment. But I was like, eh, this is. It, I agree with you. Is this really necessary? I didn't think the it was. spy kiss it was again, cheesy. The what was the spy, the the Russian spy there when she kissed him in the hotel. Oh yeah, I mean that was that, that felt like such a a movie trope where like she's the translator, but she's really KGB. Um, and then mm-hmm. they they take a picture of it and they're trying to blackmail him. There was there was a lot of that like that felt kind of. Like it empty, I don't know if it was a, it wasn't really an empty threat, but there was a lot of, the filmmakers are trying to create a lot of tension and danger that really didn't feel like there was that much maybe yeah, there. Yeah, it's weird because it still had like an $80 million budget. Like it wasn't was it, cheap. It was, it was 80, 80. It was $80 yeah. million dollars, this movie? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't know it was that high. Yeah, I mean, they had, you know, they had like, you know, because they had that, they had effects and graphics and stuff like that. But I just, I just felt the stylistic choices some were like covering up missing shots. This just that. But I feel like mm. I, I use the word cynical, but that's just because like that was where my brain went right away. But that could just be me, you know. <laughs> I'm surprised yeah. this is an eighty million dollar movie for what is basically a a film shot in rooms. That's what. Yeah, I mean it. <laughs> You know, um, Taron Egerton, uh, the film which has an impressive eighty million budget, takes place. Yeah, it's eighty million. Crazy, huh? Yeah, eighty million for yeah. that movie. Yeah. God. Oh, but there's yeah, also yeah. like VFX in it too. You know, I mean, that can drive up costs and stuff. Yeah, but that seems that seems like double what this movie should be. Still, anyways. Um, Listen, especially you can't have a sexy. I said you can you can have a sexy car chase. What is it? Car chase? It wasn't that big a car chase. That's the thing. No, was... and you can have a sexy scene like that with an orange car. It's not sexy. <laughs> Sorry, it's not like John Wick. It's How sexy. much was John Wick's budget? Hundred million. And this was eighty. Yeah, and <laughs> and but but see, but it makes sense because John Wick's budget is because he's. John Wick's budget is all it's like the choreography of the like I can see I can see them being similar in cost because a lot of the things with the Wick budget is like the the way it looks but if you think about it a lot of it is interior built sets with like fight choreography yeah, you know like yeah, okay we're not going to compare John Wick 4 to <laughs> to Tetris but anyways um so there, there was you know getting back to the story here there there was one other thing that I think that this movie could have done more to that I think would have helped it there's the, one of the central relationships in this story is the relationship between Hank and and Alexi which is is uh, they're trying to establish them as this uh a bubbling friendship but like a bromance not really bromance but what am I trying to say but like basically you know he's He's uh, the wet, the Westerner coming over. He is a uh, Russian computer programmer that's living in this country. He can't profit off of his invention and he can't bring him into his home because he could be in, arrested for that. And they want it to seem like they are, f- that there's this friendship that's growing between them. I never really felt that there was enough done in this movie to. Uh, or maybe enough scenes to really show that there was the the growing friendship. There was him inviting him to his home. Then they went out to the the, the club later on. But I felt like there 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 wasn't a, a, the, enough connection really established for them that I felt satisfied with in the storytelling. I don't know if you guys agree or disagree. With that, and a lot of this movie is banking on their friendship that he feels betrayed when Alexi seems to not want to associate with Hank anymore. And I didn't really feel that much about their friendship in this movie. I don't know. 
I, I could I could I could see that. I, I mean, it, it could have been embellished more. I did like it when he came to his rescue at the end in the car and gave him to the ride to the airport. I thought that was yeah. very like crowd pleasing. Um, yeah, it's a, I, I, I mean, it, a little there could be more to it, but I mean, it might not have been embellished enough, but I, I was able to I was able to buy it enough where I was like, at least it, it seemed to be like, you know, functioning. But I know what you're saying. I didn't feel a bond that I think that they felt the audience was going to feel. But that's just me. I don't know. I felt no, more I, of the, I, the, the, the bond of like capitalism, like extracting a, a great video game that was like frozen by the communist world. So for me, it was like, that's where the emotion came in, I guess. But I know. Yeah. I didn't. Ellie, what I were you going to say? Get, I felt, no, I, I felt that the, there was a lack of development in all the characters in that film, a lack of development of the story. Uh, I, I get it. They're trying to get the rights of the game, um, but there's so many other, there's so many different characters going on, and it went from one shot to another to another to another, and it's like, who's who? <laughs> you know, there were, so there were, there were, there I, were a I lot, didn't... and it was hard to give everybody ju- the the due justice. Um, mm. I do, I do like what they did with Toby Jones's character, where he was playing Robert Stein. I thought he was fantastic. Yeah, he was as, really good. Yeah, oh yeah, he was one of them. <laughs> Every scene he is in, he steals. And when he is, uh, he wails on somebody <laughs> in this movie. I've never seen Toby Jones he does. Um, go on somebody <laughs> in a movie, and that was that that made that made my my heart glow seeing him actually <laughs> attack somebody in a movie who, who, who was who's the actor that played the spoiled son i thought his he was really good i forget the actor's his, name such a but, jerk, yeah. but um maxwell was that, that was that was kevin maxwell i forget the actor that plays kevin maxwell you know what speaking of um, the the guy that plays robert maxwell who was a notorious uh uh figure it was a real crook. guy the actor that pl- crook um the actor who plays him was it um Alum, what's his first name? Um, I thought they did an absolute terrible makeup job on him, and that took me <laughs> out of the scenes that he was in. I don't, you know, most he he was a notorious crook, but most people when they don't even necessarily remember what he looks like. They didn't need to. I feel like personally, they didn't need to do this crazy prosthetic job on that actor portraying Robert Maxwell. And I thought he looked like they had this awful caked on uh, makeup job on him. I really thought it was uh, not a very well done thing they did. So I don't know. It took me, it took me out of his, those scenes because it looked so obvious that it was prosthetics and makeup. I could see that. Yeah. I also didn't like the wardrobe. I didn't see 80s wardrobe. Yeah, well, I mean, it didn't go for. I mean, 1988 was a couple years, I think, after a lot of the flamboyant 80s. War I, would, I, I think that I think that I like this movie better than both of you guys. I oh, think I'm sure. To I, say. I, yeah. I know you it's did. Very interesting, fascinating. <laughs> I, was, I think I, so. I, mean, I was not I, expecting yeah. it because yep. last week I was like, "Oh man, the Tetris movie that's going to be boring," and then I like really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and I like the game too. I don't know why I think that. Maybe I was just being lazy, but yeah. Roger Allen is it was the actor that played Robert Maxwell. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. And I just want to highlight. I I did really love the the nightclub scene where they're rocking out to the final countdown. Oh, that's great! Was great great yeah. moment in this in in the movie. Yeah, that that uh, that was a lot of fun too. I don't really have anything else about this. This was, uh, I thought this was okay. Sounds like Sam, you had a really good time with this. Ellie, sounds like it wasn't necessarily your thing, but um, this was. Yeah, I I liked it. I wasn't like blown away. I just, I was a lot more engaging to me than I thought. I I had a different idea in my head of what I thought it was going to be like. And it was actually, I thought it was going to be more like documentaries in style, but it was this more like souped up kind of, fun ensemble cast business thriller where flying back and forth to Russia planes, uh, contracts, people yelling at each other. My, my kind of people, you know, 
Yeah. But it wasn't and, even thriller. Uh, I, it wasn't even that thrillery. It wasn't that. No, very it, it thrillery. wasn't. But it was like the was thing is, but, but it's, but it's it's operating on a premise that if you if you love Tetris and you're blown away by it, the concept of like this is how Tetris came to be. It was more the hook to me was better than the filmmaking, mm-hmm. but I was still hooked by it. I was like, well, I liked the story, so yeah, I know. But yeah, so I think that concludes our. It was, it was more like Tetris. okay listen i this is this is what it was for me i put it i it started it ended it's gone it's gone yeah. <laughs> i don't remember it <laughs> but it was fun t- talking about it with both of you so that's how i let's, felt about the movie phantom yeah. thread but anyway yeah <laughs> let's let's move on hey so you know, last week I made the uh, announcement that we're going to be reviewing um, Always, which is the movie that I decided that we're going to watch as as punishment for both of you losing the the uh, the Oscar contest. But we decided to expand it to a Steven Spielberg retrospective. Da da. Okay. <laughs> Big theatrics. Well, anyways. Um, so we were talking before the show. Um, this is actually pretty exciting because what we're going to do is we're going to end up reviewing and discussing five Steven Spielberg movies this year. I don't know exactly what the schedule is going to be, but we're going to be doing five Steven Spielberg movies, but we're not going to be going for the the low-hanging fruit, the, the, the big obvious ones. We're not going to be reviewing Jaws or... Raiders of the Lost Ark. We're going to be trying to review some of his, just like we're going to be reviewing always. We're going to be kind of going for possibly the ones that are a little less thought of, ones that you don't necessarily think of as the go-to Steven Spielberg film. So the ones that we are going to be reviewing this year are in no particular order because I just wrote them down this way. We're going to do always, but we're also going to be Discussing Empire of the Sun from 1987. Um, we're going to be doing Duel from 1971, Amistad from 1997, and War of the Worlds from 2005. I think this is a, an awesome list. And it's a great I, list. I think I've only seen, I have not, I've never seen Empire of the Sun. I'm ashamed to say that's on my pile of shame. In these other ones, I have only seen one other time. I've seen Always many times. That was my my pick. But I'm very excited, and I'm glad that we're all going to be doing this. So what do you guys think of this uh, Steven Spielberg retrospective this year? I'm excited. I think it's a good, I, I, it's a good mix because it's across the gamut, like and it. it's different decades. And I saw Empire of the Sun in the theater as a little kid in 1987, um, so definitely memories there, but, uh, yeah, good ones. I like, I like that. I, I like the, the variety on those titles. Me too. And I've, I've and seen love- every single Spielberg movie. So for me, if this is like a kid in the candy store, getting to talk about it. Cause like yeah. it's my favorite director. So <laughs> how can you not like Ellie. Spielberg? Though? I mean, he's, oh, I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm in yeah. for it. And I just, I love anything Spielberg as well. And I, some of those I haven't even seen myself. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I haven't and seen, I haven't seen Amistad since it was in the theater. What now, 25 years ago? So this is, I'm really excited to see that to revisit that. I know I'm gonna long. cry when I see Amistad again. Yeah, yeah, it's intense for sure. Yeah, and I remember that was, uh, yeah, that was, and that was. I was living in Boston when that was when they were casting for that. I remember, and I had yeah. I knew people that were desperately I, trying um, to get. I actually think I was tr- I sent in a letter or fax trying to get a job on that movie back then. <laughs> that is, that's so awesome. That's yeah. my that's Amistad is my one Steven Spielberg. Um, signed autograph story where he was filming in the state house in Providence, Rhode Island. And there was security and all these people were like waiting outside, but the doors to the building were open. And so my friends and I just like innocently walked in we went up the steps, went around the corner and like Spielberg and his production team were just coming around the corner, like discussing their day and talking shots. 
and my friends ran away out of terror. And I was just standing there in the middle of the hall, like dumbstruck. And Spielberg was just talking to other people. And I had a bank receipt um, or like the back of a check or something that I was holding out to get an autograph on because I had no piece of paper. And he was carrying on his conversation with his production team, went through it, saw me, smiled, signed the autograph, then kept on walking and like talking to his team. Nice. And that was it. But that was, yeah, my, that was my, I still have it framed, you know. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's my like, yeah. 16, those good times. Yeah. So I think what we're going to be doing is our first movie um, will be in oh, two wait. weeks from now. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I do have to say something, Sam. Yeah, I, I did have a dream. I did have a dream where I'm working with Steven Spielberg. I like the maples. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> <laughs> was it was it a, was it a good dream? <laughs> yes, I'm working with him on set. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm sure he was kind and professional as usual. <laughs> So our first movie of this Steven Spielberg retrospective will be in in two weeks from now. We're going to be reviewing and discussing Always from 1989. So we encourage Woo! our listeners to uh, follow along with us. Find uh, Always. I think it is on VOD. And uh, yeah, join us on our discussion and review of Always coming up in a couple of weeks. All right. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our recommendation shelf. Sir. What? Are either one of these any good? I don't watch movies. Well, have you heard anything about either one of them? I find it's best to stay out of other people's affairs. You mean you haven't heard anybody say anything about either one of these? Nope. So, this is our recommendation shelf where we will be recommend- recommending recommending. Cold War thrillers tie into this week's episode. Ooh. Did everybody do their homework? We got some good uh, recommendations. All right. Who would like to go first? I will start with, um, uh, it's a really, it's a, a 2001 film directed by Tony Scott called Spy Game, um, starring Brad Pitt and Robert Redford. Um, and it's it's a Cold War thriller in a sense because it, a lot of it takes place during the Cold War. But I highly, highly recommend this movie. I like it a lot. Um, I think the storytelling is good, and I think it it actually is is one of those instances where um, Tony Scott's directing style style that some people kind of find flashy and visual um, really works well for this movie. Um, I mean, I've always liked him. He, you know, he's, he was really good with the first Top Gun and, and a lot of different collaborations with Denzel Washington. But in a nutshell, to put it really simply, uh, Brad Pitt is a spy that gets into trouble and he is in a Chinese prison. And it is Robert Redford's last day of work at the CIA in 1991. And the whole movie is told through flashbacks of his relationship with Brad Pitt, but it also focuses on him in the CIA using every trick in the book in the office on his last day of work to try to find a way to get to remotely get Brad Pitt out of jail um, without, you know, uh, his like superiors finding out. So it's just basically like CIA tactics, um, suspense, plot oriented stuff like that. A lot of skills that are in that movie, I actually learned and use them myself sometimes in life and they actually work. So there's some good like spy <laughs> stuff in the movie. I just enjoy it. I like, I enjoy the pacing and it's, it's like a pseudo cold, cold war thriller. I mean, but um, all around good movie spy game directed by Tony Scott, 2001. Yeah. And I'm so glad you picked this. Cause if you didn't, I was, <laughs> cause this was, I almost oh, nice. did. I almost did this one and I, I, cha- love that movie. I, yeah. I changed it about two days ago, but I had spy, I had spy game as my pick until two days ago, but yes, wonderful pick. And I think this is, it's available on VOD, but it's also streaming on Peacock uh, right now as well. So yeah. So wonderful, awesome movie. Also underrated. Not enough people talk about spy. It is underrated. I really, really like it because it's just, it's this, this, the story is so 
focused and specific. And Tony Scott, it just gels with his, you can just, everything about the movie like fires on all thrusters for me personally. Yep. Wonderful. Ellie, what do you got? Ah, so for me, I watch, um, so War Games, uh, 1983, I think, is it? Love, love, love that movie. No, yeah, 1983 War Games. Yes. Um, I mean, I watched it several years back, but um, I I love this film. I love watching 80s films, period. From time to time, I will spend a weekend, and I'll call it my 80s weekend, where all I watch is 80s films, okay? Um, and War Game, Matthew Broderick is one of my favorite actors since, you know, Let's check it out, baby. Check it out. What's that name of the movie? Ferris Bueller's Day oh, Off. Ferris Bueller Days Off. Oh, my goodness. I had a major crash on Matthew Broderick growing up. And uh, anything that he did, I'd be like glued to the to the tube. And uh, I love World Wars because, see, the thing about World War that was scary for me I love the whole scenario about, you know, how kids used to go out in their bikes and just have fun outside and, you know, back in the day. And uh, when I started, when it, even in high school, we had those big, ugly computers with the green letters. And oh, yeah, what's yep, scary yep, about yeah. this movie is that, but what's scary about this movie, um, even then and even now, is that, to leave uh, an AI the responsibility to manage political or war weapons is scary to me. Mm-hmm. Because at any given point, they can have a mine of their own and start a whole nuclear war. And which oh, yeah. is what and happened like, in war, war games, games, right? War Games is like, it's a 1983 movie and it's topical now. And it still plays yeah. like it... it it's because the technology is is older. The story is so good that it doesn't. It, the message is so clear in that movie. Like it's so entertaining. The, you know, it's so yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's it, it was it, it was so of the time then and it's of, of the time now. Because at any given point, we could have that and not necessarily be it a human thing, but uh, it just an AI I, decides to just. Do it, you know. It's, it's like, and it's so scary. And like, my favorite line in that movie, it's an actor that plays a general, like one of the generals in the command center, and I can't remember the actor's name at at the moment. But it's towards the end of the film, and they're like desperately trying to shut down the main computer. They're like, "Is there anything we could do to stop mm-hmm. it?" And the general's like, "Hell, I'd <laughs> piss on a spark plug if I think it can help." <laughs> I was like, "Yes, I love that." I line. know what <laughs> actor you're talking about, yeah. and, and he's and he's great. I can't think of his name. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Okay, I don't know yeah. his name, but hello, General Barringer, Stephen Falcon. Mr. Falcon, you picked a hell of a day for a visit. Uh, uh, General, what you see on these screens up here is a fantasy, a computer-enhanced hallucination. Those blips are not real missiles; they're phantoms. Jack, there's nothing to indicate a simulation at all. Everything's working perfectly. But does it make any sense? Does what make any sense? That. Look, I don't have time for a conversation right now. General, are you prepared to destroy the enemy? You bet you. Do you think they know that? I believe we've made that clear enough. Then don't. Tell the president to write out the attack. Sir, they need a decision. General, do you really believe that the enemy would attack without provocation, using so many missiles, bombers, and subs, so that we would have no choice but to totally annihilate them? Yeah, yeah, it's a fun movie to watch. Like, I, I, if you have not watched this film, go for it. Yeah, this it's so nostalgic. I, if you watch this it's film so, now, oh, it's so awesome. It's gonna be so nostalgic of the eighties and just. Uh, you know, I it is, I, and it even has I like enjoy even it. soundtrack. Like it has a folksy, like harmonica tune, and like its mm, main theme when yeah. they go to the island <laughs> and they visit the professor, professor, and they like watch the little movie about dinosaurs. Like the movie, just is, it's like eighties in the best possible way. That was Great, a good yeah, summer. Absolutely, and um, okay. Ali- War Game, Return of the Jedi, like just good movies out all at the same time. You know what? <laughs> 
Ronald Reagan really liked war games. He had it screened at the White House, and he was like, can that happen? We should look into this. <laughs> yeah. That's a great pick, Ellie. Well, I, I wish I had a movie that had the word game or games in it to stick with the theme, but I don't. But my recommendation for this week is Firefox. This is a film from Clint Eastwood, uh, starring Clint Eastwood. It came out in 1982. Uh, in my opinion, it is one of the ultimate U.S.-Russia Cold War spy films. It's It's got a very simple plot. It's got Clint Eastwood as Mitchell Gant, former Vietnam vet who is assigned to infiltrate Russian soil and steal a highly advanced fighter jet, which is capable of hypersonic flight, uh, basically invisible radar. And, and actually it has the ability to... Uh, you almost like mind control that the pilot can fly the plane using, using his mind, which was a really interesting concept. Um, fire missiles and, and do some certain things. Uh, just thinking about it. Um, Eastwood has some allies working undercover in Russia to aid him on his mission. This film has so many great moments of legitimate tension and you really uh, get a real sense of the stakes in this film. Uh, it's what I really love about Firefox. It came out in the early 80s when the tensions between the U.S. and Russia were at an all-time high. The film pulls no punches with this. The film, it's rather long, and it's, a, it's definitely a slow burn, but it always is ratcheting up the tension throughout. Plus, it has this incredible finale with the fighter jets that is only matched by Top Gun by 1980 standards. And I might add that it includes the great line of dialogue spoken by a KGB agent that me and my friends still to this day go back and forth with this line was your papers, uh, they're not in order, which I, I just love. <laughs> I really, really want to see that. Like uh, I'm in the same way that you recommended fall and I watch it. Now I'm going to watch this because I have not seen it, Nathan, but I know the cover of that movie well, because the VHS of yeah. that film was at the video store that I went to as a kid over the years. Yeah. So I can see Clint Eastwood's like face and he's the got, plane. Uh, and the he's pilots. got the, yeah. the black leather suit on. He's got the yeah. helmet on it, on his, on his side. He, he, <laughs> he's, he's badass in it. And it's, it's, he speaks almost as little as John Wick does in the fourth movie. <laughs> and uh, it's an intense, such an intense performance. Um, I highly recommend this. Uh, you can get it. You can get it on VOD. I've never seen it. Uh, but you can take advantage of your free Hoopla account that most people have with your public library subscription, and you can get it there for free. So, uh, Firefox. I watched. This was probably the first Clint Eastwood movie that I watched growing up. It came out in '82, and this and uh, it's always stuck with me. I don't know why, at such a young age, this was the movie that. Um, is the Clint Eastwood movie that I is so most so, this and probably Escape from Alcatraz were the two movies that I grew up with as a you know as a Clint Eastwood fan. So it's it's funny that these are the ones that I most associate with him as a young boy. But I love My this. These are the two flying plane movies that I love. This and Blue Thunder, I think, were the <laughs> were the. You I, know, I love this. I love this movie so much. Speaking of John Wick, um, Keanu Reeves having very few words in the movie. I read this article this week. Oh, it just I know in my what you're head. talking about. Keanu Reeves made um, yes. forty thousand dollars per word yes. in John Wick Four, which is amazing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so he's like, I feel sad. That's like a ton of money right there. <laughs> like that's amazing. I wish I had that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Those are my very our my cold... very first my very first movie, Nathan, with Clint Eastwood when I was young was The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Yeah, that's a good one. I I didn't catch up to the um, the Man with No Name uh, trilogy until I was much older, but I love those. And then two, so I love two them mules, so two mules for Sister Sarah too. Yeah, <laughs> we're, gonna have to, we're gonna review that. We're reviewing that. You know we are. I know we I have just, to. I just think of um. We I think of who's, who, Will Ferrell was imitating the guy uh, James Lipton. You know, and and I whenever you say two mules for Sister Sarah, he's like, and the next film, two mules for Sister Sarah. It's, it's a Saturday Night Live thing, and like yeah. anytime you say that movie, that's I think about that sketch. Yeah. All right, so uh, before we wrap up, I'm just going to mention a couple of the upcoming releases 
coming out in the next week. We've got Air, Courting a Legend. I think it's just been abbreviated to Air now. This is the new film from director Ben Affleck. I'm hearing some really good things about this. This is the sports. Me too. The bio sports drama, not about Michael Jordan, but about his shoes. Uh, well, specifically how Nike created the shoe line known as Air Jordan. It stars Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Jason Bateman, Marlon Wayans, Chris Tucker, Viola Davis, and Chris Messina. Also out in wide release is the Super Mario Brothers movie. This is an animated feature from the directing duo of Aaron Harvath and Michael Jelenic. This, Illumination, this is Illumination Studios, the same company that has done the Despicable Me, Minions films, Sing, Secret Life of Pets films, all very successful franchises. This film has a stacked cast uh, with Chris Pratt as Mario, Anya Taylor-Joy, Charlie Day, Jack Black, Keegan-Michael Key, Seth Rogen, among others. So those are the films that are hitting wide release this weekend. So Air is a theatrical release. Oh, yeah. That's great. I did not know that. I thought it was streaming. I, I would go to the theater for that film, for sure. Yeah. Both of those are, I'm really intrigued by. I'm hearing great things about Air. I, I've been listening to some interviews on it. It sounds like it's going to be really, really good. But we are going to be reviewing the Super Mario Brothers movie next week, which I'm looking forward to. My kids are looking forward to it. I'm actually going to see it in 40X. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> I know. Wow. So I'll, have to, I'll have to share with you not just about the movie, but about what it's gonna be like to be sprayed in the face with, with uh, <laughs> all the smells and the sprays and the moving chairs and all that. It's gonna be an experience. Oh my god, that's awesome! Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna be in the land of I don't know what what land is Mario in. I don't know. Uh, the mushroom kingdom. The mushroom kingdom. Mushroom. So I'm, all the all the smells will be in my face. <laughs> mushrooms so, well, are good for you. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna come out feeling all woozy and you know. All right, so that is our show. Um, I want to congratulate us all on our tenth episode. Yes. Woo-hoo! Unfortunately, the tenth Star Trek film is Star Trek Nemesis, which was not good. But but our our episode ten is better than the tenth Star Trek film. Right. You are my nemesis, Sam. <laughs> I'm everyone's nemesis now. <laughs> Back to the frame rate is part of the Western Media Podcast Network. You know what would be great? Go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It may seem significant, but they do help raise the profile of our podcast and allow others to find our show. We thank you in advance. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Back to the Frame Rate and on Twitter at Back Frame Rate. We need a better handle. I hear we need a better handle. I hear we may be getting a TikTok as well. Any any news on that? One quick comment. Hey, Apologies for not having time for Matt Damon tonight. Okay. <laughs> Someday we might get a TikTok. Who knows? Um, you can yeah. find past episodes of the show and other podcasts from the Western Media Podcast Network on our website, and I'll be dropping the link in the show notes. So look there. Until next week, everyone. Goodbye. I want you to know it's over.